Welcome back to another Sea Mask. We are today talking about the Eighth Commandment. How are you doing, guys? Good to see you again. Very well, thank you. Doing really well. well. Good Excellent. Year. And Mike, newly confirmed. Congrats. Thank you very much. It's it was like one of the greatest days of my life, man. Glory to God. Excellent. Of course. So happy to hear that. And for anyone who isn't confirmed, get it done because you get extra protection and it encourage you, encourages you to use those gifts of the Holy Spirit as a, a soldier for Christ, which is what we're all about here. And it's so good to hear that, Mike. And Amen. I really admire the courage that you've shown in actually doing all this publicly because there's plenty of people who are Protestant, who, who have a following, who wouldn't have done this. Well, I, you know, it, it, it's interesting. We're talking about truth in the eighth commandment and, and, and all that. Um, I think it, we, we have a duty placed onto us by God to be bold and unapologetic and convicted in our faith. And so if I'm hiding something that's this profound to me, um, then, I mean, it's almost like a, a, a denial of God's grace in my own life. I have a like a moral obligation to share. I, I appreciate the kind words, but it was like, you know, although it's, it's worth all the blowback. Because what's really interesting too, and in, in coming forward and being bold about it, um, following and reception has just exploded. And I didn't do it for that reason. I just said, I know I have to say this out loud. And there was a lot of nerves and trep trepidation, but glory to God, it's been it's been incredible. And it's getting a lot of people curious about the church too. That's it. Good to hear. That's what it's all about. Right. And speaking the truth is for the spiritual benefit, not only of ourselves, but for our neighbor as well. So that's what we're going to talk about today in large part. So the eighth commandment of God, thou shalt not bear false witness against thy neighbor. What do we mean by this? Baltimore Catechism says that we must speak the truth in all things, but especially in what concerns the good name and honor of others. Speak the truth in all things, especially in what concerns the good name and honor of others. Now, I really like this because some people on the non-Christian pagan right, in fact, most of them, really lay claim to this idea of honor and truthfulness being important components of being a man. But they detach them from Christianity, which they think is like a cocked, weak religion that doesn't concern itself with truth and honor. But here we are with the Eighth Commandment saying, actually, these things are really fundamental. God deeply cares about them. Nick, you're probably someone who's interacted with that world quite a lot growing up in your early 20s. Christianity and honor, speaking the truth, is that something that you had in mind as being associated with the faith? Yeah, it's been secularized pretty heavily. Um, Peterson basically tried to redo the the Ten Commandments <laughs> recently in what you know what was that 2018 or 19 when he made 12 rules for life and I don't remember which rule it was It'd be ironic if it was number eight but yeah he said uh, don't lie always tell the truth or at least don't lie was one of his his rules there so it's been hev heavily secularized but yeah of course of course growing up that was that was integral to the whole catholic shtick depends what you mean by truth right if you're peterson and depends what you mean by rule there's just so many things that we just don't know it depends how he defines it but um we like aristotle here and aristotle was smart enough to be able to define truth in just a handful of monosyllables like this to say of what is that it is not or of what is not that it is is false while to say of what is that it is and of what is not that it is not is true you got to have a mega brain to be able to nail truth in one sentence of entirely monosyllables and if you watch someone like peterson he's a good guy in many ways you know floundering for two hours with <laughs> wave after wave of horrendously polysyllabic words just grasping at how to pin down truth they can't do it 
because it hasn't got that like adamantine precision that we just heard from Aristotle. So it's all about recognizing reality. Most guys yeah. even know this when they talk about real, recognize real. That's the concept. Literally, is about that's what we get down to when we talk about truth. How can we define truth outside of Christianity, though? This is the problem, right? You see a society that's so um, completely has rejected the word of God, where truth has become subje subjective, right? Well, truth's a person. That's the real that, well, fundamental exactly. thing that Christianity gives us. It's yep. an encounter with a person, right, Tim? Absolutely. Yeah, so it becomes the fool's errand for someone like Peterson. Well, I guess we pick on him a lot, but I, I guess I don't care. <laughs> to to want to domesticate the truth because anagogically truth is a person holy mary is the seat of wisdom meaning she's the one who birthed uh the truth jesus and yeah one can still use one's natural faculties to do sentio logic and and to distinguish categories properly but the fact of the matter is that um, even Aristotle, I, I think he's, aside from Jesus, the smartest man that ever lived, I'd, I'd give pure under the hood uh, horsepower edge to Aristotle, even over Thomas Aquinas, I think. Even Aristotle couldn't, couldn't negotiate sential truth perfectly at all times and all ways without Jesus. So there, there's... And, and, Let's be honest, moderns like Jordan B. Peterson, if he's if he's an exceptional thinker for a modern, that's that's hard to hard to say because he has so much wrong. But um, he's no Aristotle. But if even Aristotle, the wisest man ever, needed needed baptism in order to um, fully come around to being able to negotiate the truth, then then it absolutely attests to to this anagogical truth that you're pointing out. Well, the truth is Jesus. Yeah, one of the big things about Christianity that I love is the idea that uh, philosophy can't save you. It's it's strictly speaking not even necessary for salvation. Like it, it's a it's a good thing to be able to do, and there's plenty of truth, goodness, beauty that can come your way from the study of philosophy. But you don't say that just because someone is smart and knows a lot from from books or or natural reason that thereby they're going to be saved. But that's a temptation that so many people fall into. The idea that if they just read some more or know some more, then things will be better. Now, why does it matter for society as a whole to have this concept of telling the truth being paramount for our own well-being and the well-being of others? We hear from the postmodernists that there is no such thing as truth. That's how bad it's got now. Nietzsche is like the grandfather of that whole intellectual tradition. Talks about perspectivism, where there's no real objective truth whatsoever. And you look at how that plays out with the postmodernist thinkers, even to say that there's such a thing as truth is deeply offensive to people. You have your truth, I have my truth. Don't come and judge me with your truth, bro. It's a rejection of the fear of God. And I really now understand becoming a confirmed Catholic and walking in my faith the way that I have been lately. I have never been so reverent and fearful of God. And what's downstream from that is what did King Solomon say in Proverbs is wisdom. And so the ability to discern good from bad, um, you know, truth from a lie. And so what you're seeing in a society as a whole that has replaced truth with falsehood because of this overindulgence and temporal pleasure and this individ individualistic nature, um, um, you know, it, it's like the natural byproduct of when somebody says, I'm spiritual, I'm not religious. That's like peak individualism. And we're kind of seeing like the height of the the apex of the enlightenment. It's starting to come the other way. I mean, we're seeing how many people are coming back to the faith. And one like small exchange with Peterson, I can't remember who it was he was getting interviewed by. Do you believe in God? Just ask a straight up question. And what do you mean? What do you mean you? And what do you mean believe? And, and you're like, okay, um, how does anybody take this guy seriously? I'm reminded of John 1 set, you know, set at the end of the traditional Latin mass. It's 
arguably my favorite part of the mass. I don't know if you're allowed to say that. Probably the Eucharist is supposed to be, but I just find John 1, especially when recited in Latin, to be like the greatest narrative intro of all time. It beats in the beginning. It beats Genesis 1. Um, uh, and when, when I realized or I was informed that the word word was logos and that the word logos meant meaning, and so the the person of Christ was meaning, and then through meaning all things were made, which is to say that the actual nature of existence itself is is rational, it's coherent, and it's meaningful. It's the then John one becomes the greatest refutation to nihilism. Existence itself is inherently meaningful because it was made through the person of Christ, and then that person was made flesh. And the and the world knew him not. So to kind of go back to your question, well, your truth versus my truth or whatever, like truth showed up and we didn't understand him. His own did not understand him. And, but then he gave, he gives an opportunity. Like if you start reading John one through this lens of truth being the person of Christ, it's, it's telling you exactly what happened. Like meaning came into the world and presented itself to the products of itself. And it wasn't able to understand it. And it was wandering around saying things like, well, that's just, that's your truth. That's not my truth and so on and so forth. It's hauntingly beautiful to reread John 1 through this lens. There's a really deep connection, I think, between the Eighth Commandment and religion as a matter of honor owed to God generally as an example of the virtue of justice. Because really what we're, we're honoring in our neighbor and in ourselves when we have to love our neighbor as ourselves, it's the image of God in us. So the two things are deeply connected. God wants us to to love um, him, ourselves, and our neighbor because we all, to some degree, uh, participate in God. And when we're thinking about why the good name matters so much, that's what I hold in mind anyway, that the, the honor between all three of those, God, self, and neighbor, is deeply interrelated. So we have to respect the good name of our neighbor by not making known his faults when we have no right to do so and by not making false accusations against him that's about holding to the truth when we have no right to do so so sometimes we do have a right to make known the faults of our neighbor and that is just another way of honoring him and honoring society because that promotes the welfare of everybody as well so it, it can be correct sometimes to reveal faults but in general we shouldn't. Now, that leads on to the next point. What does the Eighth Commandment forbid? Well, we know that Scripture tells us, speak ye truth, everyone, to his neighbor. It forbids lies, rash judgment, detraction, calumny, and the telling of secrets we're bound to keep. So we're going to have a look at these as all um, parts of that way in which we have to honor our neighbor by speaking the truth. These all dishonor. God, neighbor, and self. So lying then, opposition between our words and our thoughts. Pagan cultures hate guys who lie. This is just a matter of natural law. A man who can't keep his word, the gangster, the mafioso, will regard as scum. It's all about a matter of honor again. It's being deceptive, is being false. But people do that all the time now. Yeah, I'm reminded back. of uh, the the Rand quote from from my all time favorite book, Atlas Shrugged. She says, "People think that a liar gains a victory over his victim, but what I've learned is that a lie is an act of self abdication, because one surrenders one's reality to the person to whom one lies, making that person one's master." condemning oneself from then on to faking the sort of reality that person's view requires to be faked. 
The man who lies to the world is the world's slave from then on. There are no white lies. There is only the blackest of destruction. And a white lie is the blackest of all. And, and, and go ahead, Will. Satan is the father of lies because it's about unreality. Yeah, I just with with the self abdication and there's that there's no white lies or whatever. I'm reminded of, uh, well, obviously all of us in our own right and what we're what we're doing. But when Tim and I were ideating on what a woman is and how to go forth with production and the outline, there were several conversations that we have that. Like there was not, we wouldn't change the, like the capitalization of a letter when it came to the points that we were making, because it was the difference between all of it and none of it. And the, the purpose of what we were trying to do was to say all of it. And those tiny quote unquote white lies would be us abdicating all of it. And that will often result, hopefully not in this case, but in most other cases it results in and you don't you don't get very far in society if if you don't sacrifice some of that yeah under yeah. lying undermines trust between people if you find out that a friend has lied to you you can't trust him again but i like how you're phrasing it there nick is you you can't respect or or really trust yourself either when you know that you've lost that frame in submitting to someone else by trying to deceive him because you think you can't present yourself truly. It's a loss of honor in your own eyes too. Tim? Yeah. Well, hopefully we can talk about detraction too because that's sort of on the opposite end. It's almost like speaking too much in, in a little bit, but I, I did want to address the, the heft of what good men will struggle with. Um in terms of how to speak truth is what Nick just expressed here. It's like, okay, I'm not, I'm not speaking in contraries. You know, there's, there's not dissonance between my thoughts and my words. I'm not saying that this um, substance is a different substance or something that's like a bald face, oozeological lie for Aristotle. But we should discuss that this this point that in order to thrive 99 times out of 100 perforce one 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 has to self censor aspects of their message like even someone with a mic and a camera and the people that self censor and and burnish what they're saying according to the expectations of the masses with regularity go far farther i mean this is this is undeniable the people that even play with the algorithms think about what that is when you're a content maker and you're like well i'm going to see what's really popular today you've always got your finger in the air to figure out which way the wind's blowing or even if you're like oh i want to just figure out what's really hot topic before choosing my show today that means that you're choosing your words according to what will be popular. And that's not always at its most basic iteration. That's not always a sinful lie, but it does reflect a, a cattywampus disposition, um, an attitude that's off and that's, that's unmanly and is not fully honorable. Um, as, as content makers, there's some sort of covenant. I think that we're under as people that have any audience to just be like, look, we wanted we wanted to do a show on on this. Sometimes we want to do a more pop culture show, but we wanted to we wanted to make um, at least ten shows on the Ten Commandments. We're going to do that, come hell or high water. And without that commitment, which most content makers never undergo, they never make that commitment. Then it's um, a similitude to lying. It's a kind of uh, dishonor, a, a real kind of dishonor, not a, a, a merely analogical one, whereby one is like, well, I'm gonna. I'm going to amend what I'm saying based on what my audience expects to hear. And folks should just know that this is part of the equation in, in the input output machine of them, them plugging into my channel, tuning in. They know there's going to be some adjustments. There ought to be some adjustments in their mind or something that's lost in transliteration where they know that I'm not saying a hundred percent of what I mean all the time. That's not what content makers do. 
they have to deal with the algorithms and the swarming herd who's expecting them to say certain things. So it is an, an important aspect that's um, adjacent to lying, saying what you're expected to say. That's what yeah. led me to, it was that particular conviction that led me to being public about my, my walk with Catholicism. I was very quiet right. about it before. Right. And so there was this, I had to reconcile the fact that, okay, well, I understand that with these social media platforms, there's some level of tact, you know, with regards to your speech. So you don't get flagged and banned and stuff. And that's just being, in, you know, being smart about keeping your, uh, your platform. But then it was something completely different to completely omit the most important part of my life. And so to me that there was this conviction that this is a lie by omission. Mm. Right. And I had this like duty to share this particular truth because those people that are kind of putting their fingers in the air and always kind of trying to see where the wind is blowing never really end up going anywhere because they don't really represent much of anything. There's no firm stance. They're trying to play the algorithm. They're trying to play both sides of the fence. And I firmly believe if like you're a fence sitter, well, it's like Satan built that fence that you're sitting on. And it's very, it, it, it harkens, well, it reminds me of what Jesus said in, in book of Revelation to the church of Laodicea. It's like, you're neither hot nor cold, you're lukewarm, therefore I spit you out of my mouth. He also said, let your yes mean yes, and your no mean no, anything else exactly. comes from the evil. But Mike, I, did, I have to disagree here on, um, I, I think all of the popular, I, I can't think of a really, really popular stream podcast show that does episode like regular episodes that you know at least someone that made it on his own that isn't one of these ones that's like not not a fence sitter you got to be fashionably on one side or another but i i think this is the, like the formula for how how you go far i i think it's something that has whole held um any of the four of us back and that, that's what nick was expressing don't you think it holds you back to be a truth teller i mean this is a desideratum of heaven it's um it's a kind of shackle here on earth what i see think? exactly what you're saying yeah it, it's it's hard to con yeah i i can see that point for sure it, it makes sense but you know um i think what's really beautiful about what we're doing is i don't really necessarily care about how many people follow me I just know that I, I have a an individual duty not to water down the truth. No, you 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 are right. You, you know these guys that are saying that they're conservatives are kind of all over the map. They're not truly conservative. They're kind of, you know, uh, a very lukewarm um, ver version of whatever that is. And if you look back to their earlier content, they usually started off like staunchly on one side, and as they gained popularity and as they became right. you know beholden to the system and the algorithm and sponsors and et cetera, et cetera, you see this watering down of the message. But Tim, I think you know you're a great example of a guy that's got a big platform that's never watered down the truth, and so and I think it's really important that we're doing this type of work so we can get more guys you know in the trenches speaking in this way. Because if enough guys do it, I mean the algorithm and everything has to naturally kind of follow, does it not? I believe there's there's power in that and influence. True, yeah, I mean, but Tim Tim's overall social media footprint could be astronomically bigger if. For sure. yeah he had cocked more on just a handful of topics mm -hmm. yeah the divorce Agreed. and civil civilly remarried being a big one is super alienating um my i wouldn't imagine that if post conversion and reception into the church if you were kind of given an abraham and isaac moment you wouldn't have hesitated to sacrifice your your social media accounts like if you knew that saying by the way guys i became catholic if your follower count went to zero there's not a doubt in my mind that you wouldn't have done that if if such a um thing was was how it worked it obviously doesn't with respect to catholicism but it kind of does with with other stuff you know you look at njf and the things that he mm -hmm. underwent for the last eight years since he was 18 years old and correct or incorrect, that guy stuck to what he believed to be true for eight years, and he paid dearly for it. And so what seems to be a trend is you see this in health, too. I Sorry if this craps on anybody who likes his stuff. Um, Andrew Huberman, I believe, is the Tim Pool of health, where he, yeah. can, he can just have like a four-hour-long stream about nothing 
saying like, did you guys know that like, if you get sleep, you'll feel better than if you did <laughs> not get sleep. And if you guys get sunshine, hear me out. You'll feel better than if you did not get sunshine. There was a study that just came out of Stanford that said this, trust me. And it's like three hours of this and people like watch it and feel like they're getting healthier. You know, it's, it just across the board, all content has to, in order to be successful, cater to the lowest common denominator. And the lowest common denominator are the people in John 1 who, when like the truth was made manifest to them, they did not recognize it whatsoever. And what I think that gives rise to is this kind of strange phenomenon that the only place now that you can find any kind of meaningful truth is on the fringes, is in the fanatics, is in the radicals. To the point where, like, the four of us are the only four people that I'm aware of, I'm happy to be proven wrong, that are speaking the whole truth and nothing but the truth, so help us God, on the subject of patriarchy and masculinity. And so we're, we would be considered extreme to say, hey, women, sh women should be the one changing diapers, or, or, or even you know anything approximating the sorts of things that we propose on this show are considered like radical and extreme. But then there was a guy, I can't even remember his name, some uh, tapered bearded man with a ball cap talking about masculinity, who if you check his Wikipedia page, uh, we were sending this, uh, Will, we were sending this in the CMAS chat a while back do you remember the guy i'm talking about who his youtube page just kind of popped up out of nowhere and he was getting like half a million views per video mm. yeah I've, I've forgotten his name now but he's like a, the ex navy seal or something like that yeah he also worked uh, in the government like as a as a politician and then like the machine got behind him and if you watch like a reel or a video of his he's not actually say he's just andrew huberman it's like, it's better to be a good father than a bad father. And like the middle 70% of the bell curve is just like, bro, wow. Dude, dude, <laughs> flamethrower. Did you just hear what he said? He's totally, and they'll even, they'll even, the middle 70% of the bell curve will be, you'll think you're crazy because you hear him and they're, they're complimenting him precisely for that area of deficiency that you're critiquing him on they'll be like bro he will just tell it how it is can you imagine all the bad fathers out there right now they're like i'm gonna turn this off he is risking his nut and you're like, yeah it's it's frightening because it's a truth telling show well you know eighth commandment tell the truth all the time and it's a masculinity show every show of of C mask is Christian masculinism and how to do it. So truth telling in the realm of masculinism is, I guess the, the kind of species within the genus of today's episode. Um, it is true. I just want to say that for anybody out there listening, this is the only show that will tell all of the truth on the, the, the topic of intersexuality and in you know, like, I mean, the red pill ain't it even, even other Christian Christian kind of, masculinists are, are getting something wrong there i think we're right over the mark and um again this just this just demonstrates what i'm saying it's like you if the establishment throws its weight its wealth behind some guy that's saying like let's do a let's do a, a masculinism talk it's high time for that you can bet everything you own that it won't be the the gnarly stuff the the stuff that that loses views and this is the same thing if you go to like any church in this era of absconding fathers and this era of you know feminism within the within the catholic church you go to any parish at least once a year they do have like a men's event mm -hmm. men's speakers about masculinity mm -hmm. and it's always just anodyne bullshit it's always like, look, man, we need to get down to being men and we need to, you know, we need to be better fathers and husbands. And it's like, okay, no one's going to disagree with that. And they're like, we can't pin everything on our wives. No one's going to disagree with that. Like our children require us to be even more alert than we are when we get home from work. Like no one's going to disagree with, like, you can always be better. 
I would start in the scene in the Catholic scene in 2019 when I announced I was writing the case for patriarchy. Before I'd kind of been blacklisted by a lot of these places, you know, TNT was happening. I, I, you know, so people were like kind of either up or down on Tim Gordon and Taylor Marshall in Catholic circles. But then I went on Matt Fred and I'm like, I'm writing this book. And he's like, oh, okay, what's that all about? Or whatever. That's a horrible. <laughs> <Australian> <laughs> like Sorry, Will. Yeah, I made him sound like you. <laughs> no, not even really. He just sounded like a guy that can't do accents. But, um, you know, he said that with the, you know, like, so something, 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 kangaroo, wallaby. What's that going to be all about? That book. <laughs> and then I was like, okay, well, here, here's what it's all about. Like, wives need to be submission, submissive to their husbands and all things except sin. Wives need to be thin. I'm so sick of these out of control ladies throwing their weight around literally and figuratively. I just come from Disney World. Um, wives need to wear what their husbands like and, and and do what their husbands like. The woman was made for the man, not the man for the woman. War, woman is the glory of man. Man is the glory of God. Um, really embrace the fact that there are two sexes. There aren't one. And that means there are two ergons. Basically, there are two separate things. Men are the ones like doing stuff and women are the ones that are there as help meets. Okay, so any of these five or six things like cost me People think it's it's that I I wasn't pro SSPX when it was really fashionable to be so in in like 2018. That wasn't it. It was that that cost me a lot of even my trad audience because the men are so henpecked. So um, they're like, oh no, only they tell these people tell these fairy tales to themselves to help them sleep at night, which is always what I guess you'd tell a fairy tale for to help you get your Z's. But. Um, and they're like, well, trads are really pro patriarchy and, and Novus Ordos aren't. I, I think even Father Ripperger recently said 80% of trads are, are feminist households and we're, we're like, try 99. Base but, um, Chad. But, Base. but the point is they tell themselves this and then it's like, okay, but what about Tim Gordon? Then you 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 get the the trad wife coming from out of the kitchen like, oh, I'm sorry. I'm sorry. Now that that's too far. That That proves the point we're talking about here. Which yeah, is Tim, again, so, the irony in John 1 where they say that like you're speaking with the literal word of God. So you are regurgitating the logos. And then the people knew him not. Like that's how, happening again. <laughs> how much bigger would you be if you if you spoke the Schmitzian message of, well, you know, woman was made from a man's rib. Therefore, do we walk side by side, bro? That's 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 how it is. It's much like on Instagram, like the masculinity space. These guys that make so much money talking about, bro, if you just stepped up as a man, she would just be a feminine woman, bro. She wouldn't have you would she wouldn't have to do anything. You just got to step up. You got to be Fabio on the horse, bro. Six pack, six figures, showing up stoic, flowers every day, massaging her ass or whatever it is, and she would show up and and just be the perfect feminine woman. The unpopular message is, uh, no, I don't always have to hold space for my wife. Yes, I do have to put her in her place sometimes. And she should be always open to sex. And then right. from there, it's it's like, oh, oh, he went, that dude went there. He went there. He really went there. And there's guys secretly in the back gang. Yeah, Mike, say it. Yeah, Tim, say it. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. That's what we're talking about, man. Yeah, I, I don't. It's, it's, the full answer is, I think, I think the sweet spot for someone like me, if I were going to cuck or sell out, I think it, I don't think it would be full on Mike Schmidt's like woman's prophet, like, you know, <laughs> crying, crying every episode and saying that, you know, whatever he says about Ephesians 5, 21 and 22, that we should like just cut it out of the Bible or whatever, burn it in effigy. He doesn't really say that, but just, you know, he's like, no, wives do not have to obey their husbands. He makes that utterly clear in his video. I don't think that would be a sweet spot for me. He caught, if you look at the comments in that video, he caught a lot of flack for it, but people are like, well, no one bats a thousand. Um, I think even now there's a basic consciousness awareness in the church that that's bullshit and that this is this is a false gospel. But people are willing to, you know, because he's a nice guy, people are willing to overlook that. And that's kind of what his ministry is based on. So <laughs> I think the sweet spot would be more what, the trads tend to do when this thorny uh, topic of intersexuality comes up, which is more like um, was something uh, I've been critiqued by Eric Sammons and his, his wife, I think 
where it's like, look, we're, we're trads, you know, Tim's probably not even trad enough. He probably, you know, needs to be nicer to SSPX. Not that I've ever been mean to the society of St. Pius the 10th. I've nothing against them, but this, so they'll be more thorny there. Cause that's where the wind has been the last five years is to be, be, be even more trad there. But because you're calling out trad men who are still henpecked by their wives, 99 times out of 100, even in trad households, even Father Ripperger says 80%. I think Eric Sands will say like, well, yeah, but behaviors, ergon doesn't always follow telos, the goal. Like, so like a man can't be a woman, we know that. But that doesn't mean that a, a man can't do woman things. And that's why that was when Diapergate happened this time of the year, I think last year, wasn't it, Nick, where Eric Sammons was out there critiquing me and he's like, that he wrote some article like the trads who are too trad on this. Like, okay, you know, remember wearing a dress for a man, that's just a behavior. That's just a behavior. That's not, that's not getting a sex change operation. And if you just wear a dress, I, I say, oh, that's kind of like, you know, hey, I'm going to, I'm going to do the dishes and I'm going to, um, I'm going to change the diapers and my wife will go to work for me. Trads are very split that, okay, well, maybe these shouldn't work, but we, we want to kind of seed something here. So at least do one of these three things. You don't have to let well, your wife go to work for you. You don't have to do the dishes or change diapers. You can't say three out of three. I'm like, no, F it. Three out of three. Men do men things. Women do women things. Anything else is wearing a dress. R related to that, Tim, is the guy who might uh, hear you say something and then like text his buddy, like, you know, Gordon said, um, you know, that, that the way I do things isn't very masculine, like around the house, but here's a, here's a selfie of me in tweed. I, I, I got to be masculine. Yeah. Right. Yeah. And his friend's like, yeah, yeah, of course, as long as you've got your tweed, that's the main thing. And you've got your bow tie as well. That that's what masculinity is really about. They want it to be about the accessories, but I want to yeah. bring this back to scripture quickly because we shouldn't be surprised that if you are speaking the truth, then you will get some of these painful consequences. Blessed are ye when they shall revile you and persecute you and speak all that is evil against you untruly for my sake. So to speak the truth and to endure all those things as a result of it actually puts you in the company of many of the most honorable men of the past. That's just how it works. And we're told that lying lips are an abomination to the Lord. Proverbs 12, 22, lying lips are an abomination. So you might be able to build a much larger following. You might get paid a lot more, all the rest of it. But really, that's not worth anything to you. Virtue is the only thing of real value. And you hold to the truth, and that's what you cultivate. Now, people listening to this might be thinking, hold on a minute, guys. You're judging people. and we can't judge because that's rash judgment. So let's just clarify things on that. Baltimore Catechism says, a person commits a sin of rash judgment when without sufficient reason, he believes something harmful to another's character. Now, I've heard this so much that you just can't judge at all. Yeah. Judge not lest you be judged. But this is saying without sufficient reason without certain knowledge you don't want to just easily believe things that will undermine or destroy the character of another that's ridiculous we're told before thou inquire blame no man before thou inquire but mm -hmm. if you inquire mm -hmm. and you realize actually hold on i've got sufficient reason and i now get certain knowledge then now i'm going to judge and that's okay Nick, you're nodding along like this rings a bell. The before I inquire thing, I think, uh, gives very good pause. And I, a part of why I was nodding is I was just running through in my own head the instances where I would have saved myself a bit of angst and interpersonal difficulty if I had just uh, tapped tapped a friend on the shoulder or inquired with the individual and said, was this running through your mind? Oh, it wasn't. Okay, cool. Cool. All right. Yeah. Everything's fine. <laughs> well, it's, it's unfortunate uh, kind of byproduct of like the Protestant understanding of the Bible and 
you know, le judge lest ye be judged, bro. It's like, how about read the rest of the chapter and verse? And also, too, it's also the distinction between, oh, you shouldn't ever be angry. It's like, well, no, there's such thing as righteous anger as well. What do you think Jesus, how do you think Jesus felt when he was in the temple flipping tables and chasing them out with whips? You know, it's it's like, <clears throat> and, and even the way that I understand anger in the Catholic sense is that, is the intention and heart posture to harm or is it to correct? And you guys can correct me if I'm wrong there. Um, and I think if there is sufficient evidence of, of a, a brother or a sister sidestepping, then it is your duty, God-given duty, to rebuke that sidestep and to correct. That is part and parcel of speaking the truth. And like Will Nolan, <laughs> the truth hurts at first, but it heals in the end. It's like, well, that's that's part and parcel of walking with God. What do you guys think of that? Yeah. Brash judgment isn't masculine, but judgment is for the reason that you talked about there, Mike. And when we are uh, judged by God and get what we deserve, uh, we should welcome that because that too is a matter of honor. Mm -hmm. right. Augustine says that hope has two beautiful daughters, anger and courage, anger at the way things are wrong and the courage to change them. So that, that's almost exactly Wow. Which you said, Mike. But That's beautiful. Before we wrap up, I, I, I do. I want to at least get your guys' take, if that's cool, on the detraction thing because yeah, that's coming detraction, up next. Yeah. Okay. Okay. That's an important one, and yeah, that's, that's sure. a tough I one. To I never on know. That. Yeah. Yeah, it is difficult. So for people who don't um don't know, the the Baltimore Catechism just defines it like this: uh, a person commits the sin of detraction when, without a good reason. He makes known the hidden faults of another. And it's difficult to know what that good reason is sometimes. And I find this comment from the priest in a footnote interesting. Let me just read it out. It's a couple of sentences. There must be a sufficiently grave reason to reveal the hidden faults of others. For example, the defense of oneself or others. The correction of others by their parents or superiors, the welfare of society, as one is obliged to inform public authorities of another's secret crimes. A person who has been found guilty in court has lost his good name owing to the charge proved mm. against him. Mm. It is not detraction to speak of this court action to others, nor is it against the Eighth Commandment to speak of faults that are generally known in a community. It is, however, more charitable not to do so. So that's just a quick overview of some of the occasions when you've got a good reason to reveal the hidden faults of another. Tim, what are your thoughts about that? Yeah, my thoughts are that the difficult in that exact quote that the priest gave that was to set, um, an attempt to be an earnest attempt to be clarifying. You still have the same difficulty at the heart of the matter. For instance. If I'm talking to a young person that doesn't know about the O.J. Simpson trial, which is like a big deal, kind of like America's turning point, arguably, in the middle 90, whatever that was, 95, it was a big deal. And then he was like, well, who's O.J.? Oh, wasn't he a college football player? Yeah. But did you know he actually, like, killed his white wife? And, um, you know, it was this whole thing. And at the time, like, in America... Uh, American black people would pretend they thought he was innocent when everyone knew he wasn't. And so, I mean, I just revealed because I'm wanting to talk about the cultural situation in America in the middle nineties. I just revealed to someone who didn't know OJ's that OJ was a murderer, that he was a murderer. And it, it's got to be one way or the other. The priest says, well, and the, the church kind of teaches, well, there's got to be a grave reason for doing it. And they're like, well, it's a court case, and it was murder. He could murder someone else. It's like, yeah, but I'm not on the jury, bro. I I discretionarily revealed. I kind of brought it up out of the blue to talk about the cultural situation in the 90s that this guy was a murderer. And even though there's already been a judgment on the case, um, so the people who were there and alive knew, I discretionarily just disclosed to someone that otherwise wouldn't have known for basically no grave reason that uh that oj's this murderer guy and so i i think the church needs to clarify more whether there needs to be a grave reason because once you start talking about well there's got to be a grave reason why okay imagine um hypo b 
thought experiment B. I'm home and my wife is out taking a walk and I'm looking in my backyard and a weirdo like naked streaker guy just runs through. And just I'm like, that was that was weird. I want to tell someone just because it's funny. And uh, let's assume he doesn't like do anything actually harmfully, just passes through and I never see him again. That's definitely, I think, uh, um, insofar as only I saw it, a, a private sin. <laughs> and like if there if I have to have a grave reason to disclose even to my wife, my fellow landowner or or whatever her status is, some weird naked guy just ran through the yard. Then I'll, I, I'm sitting there getting scrupulous. Can I even tell Steph when she gets back from her walk, like this guy st streaked through? So I just, uh, obviously the strong smell test intuition is that, yes, I can disclose this, but the grave reason for it, um, for exposing the sins of another or, or what counts as private have to give. It's either what counts as private or the gravity of the reason to expose, no pun intended, mm -hmm. You know what I mean? It, it, it wouldn't pass the test that the church always gives or even the 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 um the litmus test that the priest gives. Do I have yeah. something wrong there? Well, if you if if you don't name the guy and you're not doing great harm to his reputation just by saying to Steph that you saw the streaker run across your yard, I don't see how it would be detraction, but yeah, okay, but you, change it. Would... Change it. Say say it was a neighbor from the other end of the neighborhood. I was like, that's Bob Thompson. Bob Thompson yeah, yeah. just ran butt ass naked through the yard. I, I I'm just being honest. Yeah, yeah, it could there. be. Yeah, and and then um, someone else finds out, and then the whole neighborhood finds out. Then his reputation's damaged, right? Then there you go. That that could be detraction. Well, now, how does that square with the no sin is actually private sort of thing? Right, right. It's public and in could, nature. Could has could a public classify as detraction too? Oh what? yeah, for sure. Yeah, I think that's where yeah. most people fall into it. Like I'm yeah, I'm really grateful for being self-employed now because ninety-nine point nine nine percent of office politics is detraction. Yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> so true. So I'm, I'm thinking oh go ahead, Tim. I'm just saying I'm trying to parse all, all all gossip that's not a slander is detraction, Mike. And I'm trying to par I strongly intuit that I can tell my wife. This new, you know, nude Bob right. Thompson just nude it up our yard. And but but it it doesn't score at the definition. Go ahead, Nick. That's all. I'm just trying to parse. Go ahead, Nick. Bishop Fulton Sheen in his, I think, autobiography. Um so he he was in collaboration with somebody with his TV show and some ministry that he was working on. I'm not remembering the details fully. But this guy uh, screwed him over big time. Also, there was some extortion and expropriation of funds. And um, in his autobiography, Fulton Sheen only reflected on the good things that this man did when he had every opportunity to spill. How, because specifically why it's relevant is Fulton Sheen took the fall for what this guy did behind the scenes and it lost Fulton Sheen his show. And hmm. in his autobiography, he just said he only said the good things about this man and then moved on. So I just see that as a very interesting example um, where hmm. even when you have great, like legitimate grave reason, and it's more of even a matter of justice and like reclaiming your own reputation, you could argue that he was being sort of actively detracted from. Uh, publicly because of this he still took the high road and then uh, another thing that i try to hold in tension in all this is do i notice in my own heart a sense of delight from sharing the sins of another person right because god we, we gossip because it feels nice it feels it feels nice to expose the sins of others because it makes us feel less bad about our own sins um and there's just something like furtive about sharing that. So I sort of do an audit in the moment right before I'm about to share something. And I just check separate from true, whether it's true, separate from whether it's just and separate from whether it's relevant. I just do a quick heart check. How good do I feel about sharing this? Like, like pleased to share it. And I sort of use that as a compass and I just turn and face the other way. 
that like, ooh, if I feel too good about this, I chances are honestly I shouldn't be saying it. Not because it's not true or just, but because if I'm feeling like pleased that I get to share this sort of thing, chances are I'm about to say something detractive. Right. And and so often as well, it goes hand in hand with the rash judgment as well. Because, you know, you might be saying something about the the beliefs of a person or what particular agendas they've been advancing and all that is true. And those are bad beliefs and agendas. And you want people to know about that because you're defending something that's important. And then with a hop, skip and a jump, the conversation will be saying that this person is like a, an evil or bad person as well. And you got there far too quickly. It, it may be the case, but you don't need to talk about that yet. You need to inquire more fully. And then even when you do know, it's more charitable unless you've got a really serious reason to go into it, not to mention it. So the rule of thumb that I've got here that I like, similar to what Nick was saying, the priest just comments, we should avoid unkind remarks about others. Just in general, that's how you want to do it. And I sometimes block people on social media, not because they've offended me or offended my wife or anything like that. I just take away their ability to comment because I'm scared that they can't handle it. It's like a mm. kid running around with a sharp stick. I'm like, you're going to hurt yourself. Every single thing you're typing here, you're going to have to answer for one day. I'm confiscating yeah. that stick because you're like a child that's going to fall over and impale himself in the throat with it. You're blocked. Um, or I'll delete their comment for them. I'm just thinking you, you need to get the message that you can't go around talking like that. Um, and almost always it's rash judgment on social media. They're not even saying true stuff. It's not detraction. Yeah. They're just jumping to conclusions and assuming things about the person. And it's one of the yeah. main dangers. Social media is very hard to handle in a wise way. Most people do not have the maturity for it. Yeah. I think it's best not to engage. 99% of the time is best not to engage. True. You're not engaging with, most of the time, you're not engaging with anybody with in, in good faith. And you're not going to change their mind anyways. Um, just to add to Nick's point, you know, is uh, the moral smell test, you know, the gut check that I give myself before I speak about somebody is, am I sharing this because I want to be, get validated in my negative opinion of said person or situation? And that's usually enough cause for me to say, yeah, you know what? Should probably not. And just turn the other way, just like you said, Nick. It's 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 hard to parse through, right? Because what if a situation happens and I want to consult, let's say you guys? I'm like, okay, well, what do you guys think of this? I don't know how right. I feel about this. You know, it's like yeah. I, I I want to get my brotherly counsel involved. And so, right. as a guy who just like you, Tim, I've struggled with hypochondria and OCD, and re recently having gone to reconciliation, almost falling into uh, scrupulosity. Right. And I could really see this being just another rabbit hole. Um, so I wish there was more of a clear cut definition on this one from the church. I don't know. I, mean, I think it's fair. I... It's, it's fair to ask for clarification from the church on, on anything to say detraction is one of the minor, minor things we need clarification on marital sex ethics is one of the major things, but which we've talked about lots, but yeah. detraction I've always held. We need some clarifying statements. The clarifying statements never clarify. They further mystify. Sorry, Nick. Yeah. yeah. No worries. Yeah, I don't know if what I am proposing actually changes the like calculus. You know, Tim, you understand action theory. I don't, but of whether or not you've committed a sin. But I do try to in the moment, because even Mike, that's that's the situation that I run into the most is what you're describing, where there's an injustice, someone wronged me, and you want to go to the people that you trust and say, like, yeah. can you believe what this scumbag did? Like, let me, it's, I've, I've been sued twice in my life. Am I just going to not talk to people in my life about the person suing me and the circumstances behind it? But I think this is where what Christ is saying when he says, if you look at your brother with hate in your heart, you've already committed murder. Or if you look at a woman mm -hmm. with lust in your heart, You've already committed adultery with her. It's like, okay, that's where the real battlefield happens is in your heart and in your mind where, yeah, this grave injustice has taken place. And there's external kinetics that you are now dealing with. There's logistics. And you must go to your brothers, whether it's 
like an attorney that you're paying $450 an hour or just your friends and you're commiserating in their kitchen. Like, I can't believe I'm going through this really terrible legal situation or interpersonal situation. And the, like your only project I would propose as a Christian is how do you maintain a pure and humble heart while discerning the logistics of of solving this immediate problem it's basically how do i not to hate the person who's spending every day with their attorneys that they're paying 450 dollars an hour trying to figure out how to ruin my life how do i not hate them and again like it goes back to fulton the fulton sheen thing like i can't believe that this guy went through that many years lost his giant show and then had all of this expropriation pinned on him and when push came to shove and he goes down and pens his autobiography, doesn't say a peep. It's like, all right, Fulton Sheen, that's why that's why you're going to be a saint. Is he already a saint? It's beatified. Beatified. Yeah. It's like. Isn't he beatified? Yeah. That's what it costs. That's Spellman, what it costs. Spellman was holding up his beatification or um not spellman was it in in new york they were holding his body they were mm -hmm. he should he should absolutely be a saint and that is the proof right what you just right. said i didn't know that i want to finish this on this verse proverbs 22 1 a good name is better than great riches and good favor is above silver and gold and religion is about honoring God and God's name. And the eighth commandment is about honoring our own name and the name of our neighbor as well. So those two things are really closely related. I hope we brought that out today and how important this is to uh, masculinity as it pertains to uh, integrity and Christ at the moment when multitudes and multitudes were following him was willing to say the hard truths that turn people away. And that's what so many men today, including many of whom, uh, you know, describe themselves as masculinity influences, aren't willing to do. Very well said, Will. Thanks so much, guys. Great to Thank see you, you again. Bro. Looking forward to the next one next week. God bless. Have a great week. God bless Thanks, you guys. Take care, guys. Take care.